today is a loaded class there's a lot of material so just in and a lot of movies so to make sure we can see all the movies um, I'll start um, you're gonna talk about Reynolds numbers Stokes law of settling and swimming drag balance of forces on a on a body uh, a lot of the stuff you've already should have a lot of background on from the movies you've seen uh, before I start several things one is next week same time of class there's an exam it's going to happen in this class. Some of you are going to be in a class upstairs, just to make sure it's not too crowded. Um, and before it, I'll do a review session next Sunday, 5 to 6.30 in the call room over there. And as I send you in the email, I'm not coming prepared with anything. I might not have the exam done yet uh, by then. Who knows? So it's for you. It's whatever question you come up with, I'll answer. But there's no, I'm not. I'm not preparing any class, I'm not preparing problems. On the website, you have about 10, at least 10 exams from previous years. Go through them. And they're both posted with and without the answers. So I would, if I were you, I would do the one without the answers first, and then check your answers with the one that have answers. I think that's the best way you can learn for this exam, and you'll see what kind of exam. I now, if there's material there that I didn't teach, it's not going to be in the exam. Because in some years, I have more weeks because I do the second half. Um, of the semester. So whatever I taught you is going to be in the exam. Okay, and you'll see they, they look very much the same in, in, in the way they're organized, and I'm not about to change the way I do it. So it's going to be organized the same way. Some questions are essay questions, some are qu quantitative questions. You have to answer a, you know, a question where you have to calculate things. You may have to change units. You may have to do all kinds of things like that. So it's all going to be part of it. Okay? And the uh, last homework, so you're going to get homework today that are due next week on Monday. And the, um, the, uh, those of you who want to resubmit, those will be by the Friday of that week. And that will be it. By noon, not the coming, not the Friday of this week, the Friday of next week, you're done with my module in terms of putting stuff in. Okay, and this way you go to your vacation, not having to worry about it. And the TA similarly will have one weekend to work on it and they can go on their vacation. Yes, Amanda. Um, are we going to get back, or like, I don't know if other people have this, but like, I've only gotten back one left. You only gotten back one homework. Well, let's yeah, yeah, let's check it with the TA after, simply because we have to, 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 but by all means, any problem you had, anything you expect you didn't get, make sure we know about it. Don't, don't wait. Okay? Okay. Now, one, one element that you guys, many of you did not know, because you probably didn't read the readings, um, having to do with light and, and the reason why there's differences between latitude in, in the heat input from the sun. So what I'm going to do, oopa, the sun is not changing its angle relative to the earth. It's the earth that's changing its angle relative to the sun. So if I let Ian here, just Ian, fire this laser towards the, the, the board here. And I'm going to put here the, the earth. Okay, can you see the dot? Now let's assume a ray, the same ray exactly, going to the poles. Do you see that it's spread over a larger area? Same amount of light, but spread over a larger area. Therefore, less per area you're getting less illumination, less heating. Now if I change it simply, I can do the same by, I mean obviously the rays are all parallel, I can change it by changing the seasons. In the summer, we'll, the northern hemisphere is leaning towards the sun, and so higher latitude are in a better angle in terms of less spread, while in the winter we're, we're leaning the opposite side. Okay? So that's the primary reason. There's also the issues of longer path in the atmosphere. The primary reason is simply the tilt of the Earth to the Sun in terms of amount of um, heating directly from the Sun, amount of radiation from the Sun that you get um, in each place on the Earth. Just change of the tilt. The rays of the Sun are always, I mean, from our perspective, are parallel, um, getting to every place. That's a very, very important concept. And again, as you feel today, we're now going through the coldest stretch of the year. And we're, what, mid-February? 
The shortest day of the year was two months ago. It was significantly warmer than it is today. And that last stretch we've been through. So internalize that. There's a reason. And the reason, again, during the coldest day of the year, that's where the, 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 we may have gotten uh, the biggest deceleration in terms of the heat flux to the Earth. We lost, the, we, we, relatively speaking, we're losing the most. But we still are losing heat now. Until the coldest day of the year, we're, then we'll, have, we'll lose just as much as we gain. And afterwards, we start gaining more than we lose, and we're going to go out of it. OK, so that's the phase we're going through now. We're still losing more than we're, we're getting, but not for long. But here, we, it's going to take time before spring comes, as it always does here. OK, so this Reynolds business, this person called Reynolds, and what kind of experiment did he do that, that, that are interesting for us or relevant to marine organisms? What he did is he set up an apparatus where he'd have dyed fluid, and he'd run it through um, a fluid here at rest, but he'll have a, a pressure difference so that that will cause the fluid to run through, to, to, to form a jet. And what he found is the following. Is there a certain condition where the dye would just continue straight? Other ones where the dye will leave straight and then form this cloud, just as you see a chimney uh, stack coming out from the... And then if it took a flash, it would see these eddies forming through. This is what we're calling a turbulent flow. To show you that in movies, so here is a lab where they do just that experiment, the same experiment Reynolds. It's living straight, no problem. Now, I can play it again, but there's nothing really to show there. But let's now see the other one, the turbulent one. That's a little bit more exciting. Subscribe, comment, leave. You can see the you can see that cloud of fluid coming out. Again, I can replay it. Hi, this is Andrew from Kite Army. Oh. I've been. We don't need that. Andrew is very nice, but we don't need this. Oh, I'm looking at something else. Oh, we're looking at something completely different. That's not what we were looking at. I wanted to see the. This is what I wanted to see you to see again. Just the fluid coming out. And rather than continue in a straight line, forming that cloud. OK, so what did Reynolds see? What did he find? What did he find at low velocities, the streak of dye extending in straight line along the tube? If the water tank was not at rest, the streak would shift about, but still go straight out. As the velocity increased at a certain point, so it's a threshold phenomenon. Uh, in the tube, the color band would all at one mix up with the surrounding water. And if you viewed it with a flash, you would see these, or an electric spark, you would see these eddies, coherent eddies. To quantify his results, what he find is that uh, things were related to this dimensionless number we call the Reynolds number. There's room in the back there if you want. Rebecca, here is a handout. Um, what he found is that it, it has to do with this Reynolds number, which is the product of the velocity of the fluid, diameter, in this case, diameter of the, of the, the, the spout coming out, and the viscosity of the fluid. And that meant that if he changes any one of those, it, but get the same number, the same, at the same threshold, thing, things would go, would change. So if you used a more viscous fluid, it could go at higher velocities. If you use a wider jet, the threshold would happen in smaller velocities. But as long as the Reynolds number was the same, it would gain the same results. And that's where it came. And this Reynolds number is non-dimensional. It has no dimension. So it doesn't, as long as you're consistent in your dimensions, things are good. Now you notice I have two ways of doing vi viscosities. There's mu over rho here. There's a density here and mu. And the ratio, which we denote by this nu, is called the kinematic viscosity. Just the ratio of mu over density. OK. What else did people find? If you look at a flow in a pipe, regular flow in a pipe, when it's low Reynolds number, you're getting this type of profile. It's called the Poisson flow. It's, you can solve it analytically. When you look at a, at a turbulent flow, you get a very small boundary layer here. 
and a much more homogeneous average flow in the center. This is the average flow, not, not the variability around it. So these are the two flows. And here, I, uh, here they're scaled such that they have the same exact mean flow. What we do down here is for the same pressure. So we have the same pressure driving the flow, or the same energy. And what we're finding is that the turbulent flow overall has much less transport than the laminar flow. And the reason is, is that it loses much energy into dissipation with the boundaries, with the side of the pipe. So one of the uh, uh, big differences between a turbulent flow and a, and a laminar flow, or organized layered flow, is that lam uh, laminar flows lose less energy than a turbulent flow for the same driving force. There's, it's less, fr if you will, that the flow uh, experience less friction, and that friction is through these eddies that are shed, the variance in the flow interacting with it and giving the momentum to the side. So, very important distinction. And therefore, if you don't want to, if you think about marine system or uh, more organism system, a heart pumping blood, a heart pumping blood, you want to work with this type of flow. You want to have your vein in such a size that you don't get a turbulent flow in your veins, because then you'll need a stronger heart to drive the same amount of fluid through your body. Okay, so there's direct, in, direct physiological implication to this fluid dynamic phenomena. Okay, so now you have your sphere that falls in the lab. And we talked in the lab, what are the forces that it experiences. I have my sphere falling in a fluid, and it reaches constant velocity. And when it reaches constant velocity, all the forces have to sum up to zero. What are the forces acting? Anybody remember? Buoyancy, that's upwards. Gravity downwards. And what other force will work on it if it's in motion? Yes. Drag. Drag and there's two. Uh, drag will be divided, and we'll talk about it in a second. To both pressure drag and form drag. I mean, pressure drag is form drag, and shear uh, drag due to shear stress due to uh, f the fluid right next to it. So, if I want to know what the drag force acting on a on a body is, it's simply I just do this balance. I say F drag plus F buoyancy, in when in constant speed F to be equal to gravity, and then I can calculate the force due to drag by simple difference of gravity and buoyancy. And those I can calculate. You know how to calculate them. This is the mass times gravity. This is the volume displaced times the density of the fluid displaced times gravity. We've done it in class. So now I know what the drag is. Okay? And this will be in your homework for next week. Do exactly this calculation with the beads that you dropped in the fluid in the first lab. So straightforward. Now, the results from Stokes law, law are that when you get that, uh, when it falls in a constant velocity, terminal velocity through the fluid, it reaches this terminal velocity called the Stokes velocity. What do you think it should be proportional to? What will slow it down? What will tend to accelerate it? Let's say this way. If, uh, if the fluid is more viscous, will it go Faster or slower? Slower. So it should be inversely proportioned to viscosity. If it's bigger, from your own uh, experience, if it's bigger, would it go faster or slower? Remember in the first lab, you had big beads and small beads. Would it go faster or slower? Faster. So it should go at least as a function of size, maybe to some, some function, if it's uh, some exponent. Um, how about if it's more dense than water compared to water? Would it go faster or slower? Slower if it's more dense? If I double its density compared to water, the difference between it and water, would it sink faster or sink slower? A terminal, yeah, of the object. Faster. So it should go at least like the object's density minus the density of water. Okay, and if you do it from dimensional analysis alone, what you're finding is that it should go like this square. This is the law that's written there. 
Um, and if I do it in radius in term of, instead of, I'll put here, uh, r for radius, then I get a factor of 9 here, a factor of 2 here, and I forgot gravity, because gravity matters. It's going to go faster on Earth. And you can derive this law, except for the numbers, just from dimensional analysis of the forces acting, which is pretty cool. And this is only for low Reynolds number. So now, this is very interesting. And this is, again, something you're going to do in your next homework. If I know everything about the density of the object, its size, I know something about gravity, if I measure the settling velocity, I can get the viscosity of the fluid. And this is one of the methods to get the viscosity of fluids. Simply put beads in and see how fast they fall. And you'll do exactly that calculation in your homework for next week. Now, you just mentioned pressure drag in. So there's two drags as you're falling down. One is pressure drag, and pressure drag, or form drag, is directed at 90 degrees to the surface. And then there's what we call shear stress drag, or, or regular drag, and that's simply because of the, it's biggest on the side, and it's due to the uh, uh, no slip condition on the side. It has to go to zero here, and then it accelerates very fast to the free flow. So there's, it's higher here at the equator of the object, while the pressure drag is minimal here on the side, and maximal here, where there's almost no, no flow at all, or exactly no flow right there. So, and it turns out at low Reynolds number that only about a third of the drag is due to pressure, and two-thirds comes from shear because they're acting on the largest part of the, uh, and largest in, in surface area part of that, that bead. Now, how far do you feel, if you were an object far away, where would you feel that a, how far would you feel that an object is falling next to you? Well, it turns out even 50 radii away, in low Reynolds number, that's true only in low Reynolds number, 50 radii away, there's still about a 5% of the uh, flow velocity of the object falling down that is af affecting the fluid around it. So the fluid 50 radii away still is going to fall at about 5% of that fall velocity. Now, why is it important? You say, so what? Well, it's important because this is exactly what transmits information to mechanical sensor or an organism that something is moving around you. Okay, you're not necessarily, you're not a visual predator, you're a small predator, but you can feel those disturbances of something falling down. It might be marine snow full of bacteria, full of great juices that you want to eat because they're falling, uh, they're falling somewhere around you, even 50 radii away of that object, if it's in the small Reynolds number regime. The higher the Reynolds number, the smaller is this wake around the object. Now, a few points. Stokes law is exact. This law turns out to be an exact solution of the, f of the uh, equations for, for, for um, uh, of, of the equation that describe the fluid dynamics. There's no approximation, except for the fact that we're dealing with very low Reynolds number. Inertia doesn't play a role. And theory and observation match. And uh, as I told you, you can use falling balls as a way to measure viscosity. The fluid properties are not idealized, but inertial forces simply don't matter when you're in the small Reynolds regime. And it turns out it goes all the way to about Reynolds of 0 0.05. And in your homework, you're going to extend it to larger Reynolds number, and you'll see that it starts to deviate from this exact theory. But it's still useful. So I'm not going to s repeat too much of the things that you've seen in the fluid dynamic movies, but some important parts. Um, there was a lot there about streamlining, and when it's important and when it's not. And one of the issues is, at low Reynolds number, streamlining is not advantageous. It creates more surface area, and therefore increase your, your, your uh, loss of energy due to shear stresses. But at high Reynolds number, it reduces a lot the pressure drag. There's true, there's a slight increase in the, in, the, uh, in the drag due to shear stresses, but the loss due to pressure drag is so much more important that it's much, compared to a blunt object, that you feel less drag overall. 
And that's why you streamline object in for planes and for bombs and things like that. And, and this is why fish are streamlines, because they're in a high Reynolds number regime. While if you're a blunt object, there's a lot of drag due to pressure drag, particularly in the back of an object where the, uh, the flow separation occurs. So as you move from low to high Reynolds numbers, the fluids are very, very different. At low Reynolds number, things are symmetric. Um, and, and, and relatively simple. As you increase the Reynolds number, there's some separation, but again, very coherent vortices until you get to areas where it's completely chaotic and, and statistical. And just so you know, turbulence is still considered one of the hardest problems of physics today. A problem for which we have, we have some statistical tools, but we really do not have good predictive um, tools. So it's a, it's a very active area of research, turbulence. So what is a turbulent flow? And this is very important. Turbulent flow is a property of a flow, not the fluid. Water is not turbulent. Certain flows with water are turbulent. But the water itself can have turbulent flow and can have laminar flows. Turbulence is unsteady and inhomogeneous. This is what makes it so hard. Inhomogeneous means it, the properties of the flow vary in space. Unsteady, it varies in time. Turbulence tends to accelerate a lot the mixture of momentum and solute, much faster than it would be for a laminar flow. It steers the fluid, and the mixing actually happens on molecular scale, but there's much more surface area for mixing to take place on. It cannot simply be described by steady velocities. You really want to know something about how variable the fluid is, not just the mean flow. And it's a threshold phenomenon. It does not occur below a certain Reynolds number. And then when the Reynolds number is exceeded, it occurs. Okay, so these are things that are important to remember about turbulent flows. Now the drag, the drag we're concerned about, is always there. And it's always there because of the no-slip condition. Whether you swim, whether you fall, there's always drag. The swimmers among you know, know it very well. And you'll find a lot in the literature, people scale it as follows, as, and, and simply from dimensional analysis. Density, cross-section, velocity square. Or if you will, it's a kinetic energy per unit length. Or work done to stop motion per unit of, of length. Scaling is based, this is based simply on dimension, but it turns out, therefore, that the drag could be anything that's non-dimensional, for example, the Reynolds number to a certain power, times that quantity we have here. And this part we call the, the drag coefficient. The engineer called the drag coefficient. And you'll often find description of the drag coefficient of a blunt object of this shape or another shape, this CD. Now, how does this drag coefficient behave? If I plot the drag coefficient here as a function of the Reynolds number, it turns out, and this is for a variety of shell shapes, you have spheres, cinder, and disks, that initially the force of drag is actually doesn't go like u. It goes like, uh, like u squared. It goes like u, and therefore you have a Reynolds number to the minus 1 behavior at low Reynolds number. And then as you exceed, when you, when you get to a Reynolds number of about 100, 1,000, when you get to the uh, turbulence regime, suddenly there's no dependence on Reynolds number anymore. And it goes just like u square, uh, the drag force. So drag force goes like u square for turbulence, for turbulent flows, and like u for uh, like the directly like velocity for a, for a low Reynolds number flow. And here you have this drag crisis that you've, that you've seen in, in the movies, where at a certain point you can have a fast reduction in drag at very high Reynolds number due to things that are happening in the wake of, a, of an object. And you can accelerate it, for example, with golf balls by adding dimples on them. So as Reynolds number grows, the relative importance of skim friction or shear stresses decreases, while the importance from pressure drag increases. And this is the part that you're trying to work against when you streamline and when you dimple. So let's, let's think about organisms in the ocean. Which Reynolds number regime are they in? So if I think of a bacteria, say with a diameter of 2 micron, 
Let's calculate these Reynolds numbers. So we said, what did we say the dependence was? We had a nu in the bottom, we had u, and we had length. Okay? So for uh, this is 10 to the minus 6, so that doesn't change in MKS. If I look at a bacterium, a bacterium will be, say, a diameter, we'll use a diameter of 10 to the minus 6. This is in micrometers. Velocity, let's assume about a body length per second, which is a kind of a canonical velocity. So body length per second would be 10 to the minus 6, or 210 to the minus 6 micrometer per second. A uh, meter, sorry, we're in meter. Meter. These are in meters. I already put the minus 6. So I'm going to get for a bacterium 10 to the minus 12 divided by 10 to the minus 6. That's still about 4 10 to the minus 6. No units. So this will be a bacterium. A very, very tiny Reynolds number. Now let's move to a tuna. A tuna is about half a meter, 0 0.5. This is 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus 6. And, it, and it, its speed is, again, let's assume a body length a second. Another 0 0.5 here. Um, meter per second. So I'm getting 0 0.25 divided by 10 to the minus 6, which is about 2.5, 10 to the fifth. So 11 order of magnitude larger Reynolds number than the bacteria. And this is why we care about Reynolds number, because it's, it varies a lot between different size organisms, and for one organism, even between its different life stages, where in the plankton, um, you're going to have a very, uh, whereas you, you're in a plankton as a, as a larvae of a, of a sea urchin, you're going to have a very different size and a, and a different Reynolds number than when you're older, and therefore your swimming strategy will change. And that's, that's these are the parts that are important. Um, and I, I use the different swimming speed, but it's true. Tunas can actually do 10 bodies lengths per second, which will go even faster than that. So just in general, so you don't think that I'm completely out to lunch, um, speeds, swimming speeds of organisms tend to scale with their size. They're not on the one-to-one, -one, but they tend to be, you know, maybe several times your body lengths per second. But overall, if you throw in all the organisms you know, they tend to do, you know, two to, here it looks like two to maybe four or five body lengths per second. So you can therefore scale the Reynolds number as being size square, because the velocity scales with size, divided by so very strong dependent on size for the Reynolds number. And again, as I said, will affect differently different stages in the life cycle of an organism. So what would, should we expect from a high Reynolds number swimmer? Inertia should play a big role. We would expect them to be um, not blunt object, but rather um, very well um, streamlined. And it turns out they, they have several kind of propulsion. There's axial propulsion, where the whole axis of the organism uh, is involved in the swimming. There's one when you use appendages, and those tend to be an organism that relatively recently moved from land to water. And then there's jet propulsion. Anybody here can think about what a jet propulsion mechanism might be? Yeah. A squid. A squid, uh, a medusa. Um, so I have here a movie for you. Let's hope that's going to work. Oscillations of that. That's your mission to explain all of that. Oh, what? Well, all you have to do is put these the colored dye yeah. into the fluid. OK, it's this. Can you see it? It's not very big. Let's try to. Look at the wave passing through its dorsal fin.
Eagle Ray. Sorry. And here's your jellyfish doing jet propulsion. And again, this mechanism will never work at low Reynolds number. You're going to go back just as much as you move forward in each stroke. If you ever go to the Darling Marine Center and try to put on a scallop in a touch tank a sea star, you'll see them going through those motions. It's pretty cool. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're done with this. There'll be more, don't worry. Okay. So how do you build an, a fish with three easy pieces? You need a body and streamline somewhat, a connector, and then a wing in the back that shed these vortices that the body goes through. And I'll show you it with robots. A lot of, we learn a lot of insight on, on uh, swimming from people building robots that are emulating a lot of what here it is. No, this is not what I was looking for. This is not what I was looking for. What's happening? Here it is. You can see that body and you can see how by moving the body and moving that arm behind it, it can play with the vortices and shed them in a way that it moves itself forward. Let's continue. So you move forward again in, in high Reynolds number by throwing the water backwards. Axial underlay propulsion, what we saw with the moray or what we see with dolphins. The axial structure are used, vertebral column and associate musculature, mostly primary swimmer, evolved from aquatic ancestor, and used on dilation of the body, pass them from anterior to the back along the body to generate thrust. Physics of swimming. So two things we need to remember, thrust and drug. Thrust is the reaction force described by Newton's second law. So it's what happened when I push on a fluid or push on, in this case, on a wall and the wall push backs on me by the same force back. Uh, it expels accelerate mass in one direction in order to go in the opposite. Uh, so, as a swimmer, what you want to do is maximize the thrust and minimize drag. That's the way you're going to go the fastest. And how is it generated? It's generated by producing this wave through you in which you're pushing in this direction and you're doing it in, in at least two points here, so you're not thrown uh, right and left. These are balancing each other while pushing the fluid in opposite direction, so you can go straight forward. And with the dolphins, uh, it's done with the flukes, in, in, but in this direction. This is a sideway view. It's going to be on the, in the forward view with things like dolphins. Uh, then we have those that have appendages. Uh, some of them are undulatory, like the eagle ray we saw. And some works like oars, as we saw with the uh, turtles. And then there, for those, they have two phases. There's a power stroke. You take a lot of water with you. And then there's recovery stroke, and you're trying to do it in a way that will push the least amount of fluid in the opposite direction. So they're not symmetric. Here are examples. This is the undulatory, things like the manta ray here. And these guys with their fins. And then you have the oscillatory ones. A lot of them terrestrially derived. You see it with penguins. You see it with turtles. You see the same with, with, other, with, with quite a few marine mammals. 
And then we have the jet propulsion, and those are used by um, a whole variety of group from th that include even insects and, and shellfish, as well as uh, um, cephalopods. And the idea here is that you ch you're sucking water in by moving your musculature sideways, water gets in, and then you push it in, you, you contract it, and the jet pushes you forward. And there's a nice example here of a, and again, this tells you, when you see things like this, you realize that we actually are starting to understand how things work, is when people make robots of something like a jellyfish. So this is a robot of a jellyfish made in Japan. So there's a pump that opens and then shoot the fluid down below. Okay. Let's continue because we don't have much time. It's a so now we're going to move to the low Reynolds numbers uh, swimmers. So the problem they have, as you saw in, your, in, in the last movie you looked at, the flow is reversible. So if you do exactly the same motion back and forth, you're not going to move anywhere. You have to break the symmetry. You can do it either by having by corkscrewing through, and we'll have a corkscrew robot in the lab this afternoon, or by using a flexible or something like a cilia that, that allows you to, to do it. And now I'm going to, or this, this push me pull you that you're going to see in the movie here. Okay, come on. Where is it? Yeah. Let's see if I can have it. Come on, open it. So now we're going to look at low Reynolds number swimmers. And they can swim really fast. These have flagella. And we'll talk about flagellas in a second. They have these. Here is a flagella. Here you see it well. This is the push me pull you type. Uh, mechanism. And you can see the species dust. Uh, so it really feels like they're in honey. They're in water, but it, the way it, it feels like is like a, something moving in honey. And very viscous fluid. This is a, a, a toxic dinoflagellate, the Karenia. Has many toxic uh, within the family. Look how fast they run around. Several t bad lengths a second. And spirulina, this is one that you have in a lot of uh, health drinks. And it corkscrew, look how it really corkscrew through the water to move from place to place. And these are organisms that have a lot of cilia. Cilia are these hair like structure that they control. Another ciliate. And this is a compilation of movies we found on either the web or different uh, resources. We Another ciliate. And you can see that the motion is not extremely well directed. It's not very easy for them to go straight. But it allows them to get to waters that have different properties when they need to, or get away from something they want to get away from. Okay, done. Okay, back to. Okay, so you'll find these flagella both for bacteria and for uh, uh, which are prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. They're made differently. They're not exactly the same. The, the two kind. This one is made of a, of a millions of this protein, which self-assemble. It's a rotary motor, and every now and then it has to release it to the other side, and then it randomizes its orientation like in E. coli. And inertia, inertia does not contribute. And the question, is that true? Would you believe that? So let's, to see of, let's think of how far will a bacteria glide if it could. So what we're doing here is we have the mass of it, of a bacteria, times acceleration, ma equal f. And f is drag. So let's say it's going in a constant speed and suddenly stops. How far will it glide? How far will it go? And one way to do it is first derive a time that will take it to stop. So the way we'll derive the time it takes it to stop is say, okay, the time scale of this problem 
will be the ratio of its speed to its acceleration. So I'll do du dt, uh, sorry, u over du dt, that has a time scale. And let's see how fast it's going to stop once, uh, once it stops swimming actively. From this equation, I can derive it immediately. It's going to be the mass times 3 mu pi. OK? 3 mu pi. The mass is simply rho, its density. And the density will be something like water. So let's put here, uh, for mass, we'll put uh, a, a, a 1,000 kilogram per meter cube times 10 to the minus 6 all this cube. That would be the volume is diameter cube, and then there's 4 over 3 and a pi. That's easy. OK, and here we have 3 pi. So this is going to go something like, uh, we have, and this is 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 3 in MKS. So I have 10 to the 6. Here I have, this is going to be 10 to the minus 12. The pi goes, I have 4 over 9, so 4 over 9 is about a half. This divided by 2 seconds. So in this amount, it stops. In a, it's not a femtosecond, it's something almost like a, it's a very, very short time, and it stops. Now, how far will it go in this amount of time? If it goes one body length a second, this is 10 to the minus 11, body length a second is where it's going to stop. So there is no inertia. This is how fast it's going to take it and how far it's going to take it to go. If we assume it swims a body length a second. If we assume 10 body lengths, still not very far. So this is, this is really important because that means they don't go, yeah, so I, I used a mu of 10 to the minus 3 and a d of a 1 micron. So time scale to stop is what, what we just determined. How far we glide? A very small fraction of its length. So Inertia doesn't play any role. What's really important to learn about why flagella work or why the screwing work is that the drag along a rod, as you're pushing your flagella around, is about a half of what it is if you push it sideways. And so you are generating some thrust forward by, doing, by leaning sideways on the fluid, because there's more drag this way than this way. So if you're going in the right direction, you're going to be able to go through the fluid. This is flagellates and ciliates, which are uh, both often the same size range. Ciliates tend to be bigger um, and, and generating significant speed. Ciliates can go even faster than the flagellates. So for the eukaryotic cell, the flagellate doesn't look like what we saw for the bacteria. They have these microtubules in them, much stronger structure, much more uh, organized. And the ciliates, um, have go through this. They break symmetry by when they um, or through the water, they're far from the, the object, and then they come back very close to it in the boundary layer, and overall generating th um, momentum that's more into one direction than the other direction. So it's really important that you get away from your body where the no-slip conditions say there's no relative motion compared to when you're close to it. OK. Uh, bacterium it, uh, will tend to have a much more unsmooth motion uh, with their flagella compared to things like sperm uh, because of this, the way they coil their flagella and the need to completely redirect. But what they do is by spending less time in directions they don't want to go, when they feel that the gradient is going in the opposite direction of what they want to feel, it's going down instead of up, say, towards the food, they will flip sooner than otherwise. And overall, this allows them to do what we call chemotaxis, is find mo spend most of the time going in the right direction and not in the one they don't want to go. And these are examples of these, what we're going to have in the lab, of these robots that people have made to, again, uh, emulate this motion of a bacterium in a very uh, viscous fluid. And we can learn a lot about swimming from building these analogs. And this is it. Questions, comments. And today, um, please don't leave the lab without filling the um, uh, evaluation sheets. This is our last class, class time together. We'll have a lab next week after the exam. But it's, uh, 
this is the last formal class uh, together. Anyways, no question? I'll see. Yes? Yeah. So all the homework correction people, please stay here. The two, I'm here, the two TAs are here, and we'll deal with them now, okay? Because they, they know exactly what they got by email and what they did. Okay.